Good evening. It is Monday, the 9th of October, 2023. It is just coming up to 9 p.m. UK time. It is coming up to 6 a.m. Um, in Brisbane. <laughs> I can't believe he's woken up so early for this show, but I appreciate it uh, you know, sincerely. Um, but yes, this is part of my journey, episode 38. It's my mental health talk show. And my very special guest today is someone who's been putting out um, amazing re-edits and mashup edits and 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 you know all sorts of crazy brilliant records and great artwork to go with it and really interesting stuff um all the way from australia uh it is dj bacon hello world hello christos <laughs> how are you all i'm good man i'm good i'm good um yeah we, we've, yeah no thank you it's been it was a little while in the making but we got there um and it's great to have you on because i'm sure we've got lots of stuff to talk about <clears throat> but as with all my guests i always try and go right back to the beginning um and try and find out what when it was in their lives that music first got to them so you know was it like uh age five and what it what sort of records do you remember and also who so yeah. was it your your parents your brothers siblings friends who was it who first got mm -hmm. you into music Cool. Okay. Um, so one of my f earliest memories is like, um, I've always been a late sleeper and <clears throat> one day mum turned the radio on at like, you know, I'd always get up as late as I possibly could to get to school. I'm talking primary school here, like probably yep. age 10 or 11. And, um, this song came on the radio and I think it was, um, it was just some generic thing that was in the charts at the time. I can't actually remember the song, but I guess I was just getting to that age where I was starting to really discover and appreciate music. And, um, yeah, I literally ran out of bed and, um, I had this little, uh, cassette recorder and it wasn't even a built in thing. I couldn't even internally record off the radio back then. And I'm like, press recorded, like shove this, uh, cassette recorder up against the speaker, um, just so I could like record this song. And, um, I think that was like the start of it all for me, where it was like, um, right. oh, I need to be able to hear this again. Like, I, I love this song. Um, yeah. I think it might have been Robert Palmer, like Simply Irresistible <laughs> or something like that. Oh, wow. Um, okay. So, yeah. yeah. We're going, going a fair way back here. Um, or my, maybe even earlier. It might have been a couple of years before that. Um, right. We're talking like 86, 84, oh, 87 around there. Um, and yeah, from that point on, um, yeah, I just was. I don't know, like music was just always, I was always tapping along and enjoying songs, you know, playing in the car with the parents and whatever. But um, yeah. I think something just around that age, um, and maybe it happens to a lot of people around that age, we actually start to discover that just how unique and how amazing music is. Um, Definitely. And it wasn't long after that that I started um, buying my own records back then um and yeah um the first thing that i ever got was um there was a compilation album that came out in australia you probably didn't hit the uk um i think it was a, like an australian sony compilation or whatever but um it was called summer right. 80 it was called summer 87 um okay, and no. it, it, it had the track on it it had a whole bunch of classic 80s jams on it but the one track that changed my life and still to this day it had um run dmc uh walk this way with aerosmith like the i mean that that's the, such an amazing the, record isn't it i mean i remember that incredible. from my youth and like watching the video and it was just it was such a powerful impact um amazing. Yeah. yeah i mean it's where a lot of people's hip-hop mm. life i'm sure starts um yeah um there were break dancing jams and things like that back in the schoolyard that i used to check out and they were always playing this weird electro music that i had no idea about um but i was probably too young then i was probably only like nine eight or nine so i didn't really resonate with me but yeah when that um when walk this way came out with with um walk this way on it i um I, I looked at the back of it and it had pictures of all the actual albums that were on the compilation so I found okay. um, Run DMC Raising Hell um, and I was like, I went and, you know, went to the, back then we had a local record store even in our suburb, which obviously doesn't exist anymore because of times have changed. But um, yeah, I, so I bought Raising Hell on cassette um, and that was just all I listened to for <laughs> the next couple of years. And I was just, I'd never heard rap music like really before then. It was just like, yeah. Growing up in Australia was such an Aussie rock dominated thing. Like if you turned on 
turn on the radio, it'd be like, you know, Men at Work, ACDC, like classic 80s stuff, um, classic rock and yeah. roll. Um, so, yeah, to, to be into hip-hop at that age, um, I was one of very few as well. Like, it was totally, un- it wasn't okay. mainstream. Yeah, it was like yeah. completely underground. It was called, the radio announcers in Brisbane used to have this station called Triple M, which I think is still around. And um, they one of their slogans was, no rap crap, you know. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> no Um, rap crap (laughs) that's that's brilliant yeah so yeah that sort of triggered it all off and the first bit of vinyl i bought was the um was off that album was the it's tricky 12 inch um, yeah yeah which i've still got downstairs somewhere i tried to dig out a couple of things for the interview but um it's a vortex down there. It's, yeah. It used to be organized, but I'm sure most collectors will relate. Oh, I've, I tried. <laughs> I've been trying to get it organized. And I was like, right, we're going to get my brother to help me build this. And we've got yeah. that. And so that I don't have records on the floor. And I'm looking down and there's still records all over the floor. <laughs> but the yeah, it's... Is, yeah. When you it, do a set, you have yeah. to take out all these records from specific parts of your collection. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's the easy part, but putting them back to me is the problem because you get home from gig, yeah. you're exhausted, you've got a bag full of records, you're tired, you just put your crate back down. And then, yeah, yeah they just never get back there. It's a, it's a process. I know. I know. <laughs> um, I'm going to say hello to a couple of people who are in the chat. We have got uh, the real DJ Commando, a uh, salute. We have got Sam Tweaks. I'm going to see Yo, Sam, Sam on Owen. Friday in Belfast. We've got Ed Bond, evening of Ed. We got Tony T T Funk from Regulate Recordings. We're going to see him Friday as well. We're going to Belfast. We nice. uh, got Matt Flynn, and we have got Double P as well. So yeah, welcome in everyone. What's um, up, y'all? And uh, yeah, Sam says, "Yo, Scott." <laughs> so we've got to the point of you starting to buy records. When did mm. that then turn into getting into sort of DJing? Well, I'd say from the age of like, um, so Absolutely, this was Robert the Thirteenth. 87 like yeah 987 i was about 12 um so yeah up until i didn't actually get working turntables till about 94 um so right. there's a good you know seven years there but for those seven years um and i still thank myself to this day um i <laughs> i love the short shot remix too thanks mate um, <laughs> Um, but yeah, and still, you know, I, I didn't have decks, but I was still buying heaps of records. So, um, all the time in the back of my mind, like my main influence has always been Jam Master J, just yep. watching, watching his music clips. And like we said before we got on it, um, you know, the, the walk this way clip with Jam Master J and just how staunch he was on the decks. And yeah. I just thought like just being a kid from Australia, like totally removed from that whole scenario. I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do eventually. And look, I'm 47 now and nothing's changed. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I had this little dream when I was 12 that I was going to be like a DJ and it's definitely taken different tacks and turns. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's, it's never, I've never really faltered from that. So from 87 till about 94, obviously, you know, during school, like high school, like, you, you know, you've got different priorities. I couldn't really just go out and buy turntables when you're studying at school. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when I did eventually get some, uh, some crappy belt drives from the, the local op shop in about 94, which coincidentally was, you know, the year after I finished school. So it was like, I finally had a bit of time up my sleeve to like get into music properly. And I didn't really have any mentors or anyone to tell me how to do it. I just learned it. You know, I just picked it all up myself. I knew I needed turntables. I knew I needed Technics 1200s, but that was just a, a pipe dream really, you know, when you broke, you know, stacking fruit yep. at the supermarket. <laughs> Um, which I was for a few years there. Um, I couldn't really afford to get 1200s, but yeah, that was my goal. So I just, you know, worked, worked my ass off at Coles. Um, I don't yep. know if they have Coles over there. Is it called Coles or it might be called something else like supermarket chain? Um, Coles. No, I don't yeah. think so. No. Okay. Well, whatever your most generic supermarket chain is, that's, that's where it was. So, um, yeah, I guess something like, yeah, Tesco or Sainsbury's or okay, something. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. look, Asda. I bench. Yeah, I eventually saved up. Um, so between 94 and 98, um, yeah, I was basically, you know, just working a shitty job. Um, I was studying accounting at uni, which was a, was a bad decision. Anyway, that's another story. Um, and it wasn't until about 98 that I actually, yeah, I'd put like, I'd managed to save up about four grand. And um, yeah, I went into the DJ store in Brisbane, which was called Central Station. And um 
there was no there was only one place you could buy turntables in Brisbane and that was the place and yeah I got my two 1200s and a mixer and um luckily like I said I'd been you know collecting wax for quite a few years then and I probably I probably only had about three crates uh, but it was enough um I had no idea what I was doing I taught myself I just would spend every waking minute in my bedroom messing around with vinyl um working it out trying to troubleshoot and problem solve like how come these guys can get up and scratch their records and it never skips and you know you use, i didn't even have slip mats on man I, I didn't even know what a slip mat was no one told me i'm like yeah, but again so. let's just but let's pause though but this is like you're talking 94 98 yeah yeah sort of like that yeah obviously before mm. the internet before oh, like youtube mm. before unless you had a VHS video or something like that at that time, or maybe DVD just coming in, you'd never see this stuff, would you? So you, the there's thing, no yeah. tutorials. No tutorials. And th yeah, that's why when the internet did, uh, you know, come around, you know, late nineties, early two thousands, it was like, Oh, you know, I was so impressed with guys like Qbert who put up those scratch tutorial videos of not just, yep. you know, showing everyone how to scratch, but like saying, this is how you problem solve. If the hole on the record's too big, you put some tape in here or you, you and you put this under your slip mat to make it more slippery and all these little things that um still intrigue me that i had no idea about um so yeah you know i obviously learned a lot from that era as well you know when it all yeah. did the internet did come along it wasn't just um newbies who sort of picked up on all those skills it was like anyone who'd been in the game and doing stuff their own way might have been the wrong way and all of a sudden there's this guy saying this is the right way to do it. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, That's amazing. And and yeah. um, hip hop. I mean, are you getting into other styles as well by this point, or is it still hip hop's your focus? So, good question. Yeah, um, purely hip hop up until probably like early two thousands when I started right. getting into into the Ultimate Breaks and Beats collections. Um, but I mean. That said, you, you know, you can't live in Australia and just, you know, there's so much, everything on the radio is another genre, but there was no hip hop channels uh, or anything like that. So, um, right. yeah, it was, um, I was just, my main music that I was into was like, my, my main things were, um, you know, Run DMC, Fat Boys, Cool J, um, DJ Jazzy Jeff, um, you know, even things like Mantronics and things like that were too underground. Yep. You couldn't, you couldn't really... Unless you were a working DJ and knew the scene, you couldn't really, I, I couldn't really get those records. I didn't really know how to get them. So for me, it was like, I'd have to go into Maya, into the, just the general music section. And there was the tiniest little hip hop section. And it was only like the massive things, you know, you, you Beastie yeah. Boys License to Ill was obviously there. And um, anything that was like a big sort of overseas hip hop record you could get. But there weren't many by that stage that had even sort of broken ground in Australia, especially. Um, but yeah, um, some of those LL, LL Cool J records um, and Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. And obviously Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, um, you know, Jazzy, Jazzy Jeff, just, you know, listening to those records and listening to the scratching was so influential as well. Um, so, yeah. And again, it would have been a time when, again, pre-internet, pre-streaming, pre-on-demand like, music, you know, you had to have the record to listen to it and you would just listen to that record over and over again because you had a limited amount of records, didn't you? And obviously, only as your record collection grows, those early days, you've listened to those records so many times, haven't you? So many times, so many times. Um, and yeah, it was just like, you know, you just have a, a little stack and you go through them and yeah, you'd know every groove um, back back to front. Yeah, literally. Um, and it's, it's you know, it's definitely, I, I dare say in the UK, you guys had access just because of the pure culture of the UK. Yeah, the yeah, music, yeah. The music history and how yeah. deep and how knowledgeable um everyone over there every uk person i've ever spoken to is just so knowledgeable about music and so into it which is almost yeah. the opposite to a lot of the not the heads here but like just the the general populace in australia like they well, they well go, yeah i think okay we, we've had this conversation before about other things but i think it's because the people you're meeting are the people who are in the music scene uh, i think in a similar way that the general population like music but they don't it's not a passion if you know what i mean yeah um yeah. and they then the, yeah enough to get to get real yeah. jobs or whatever <laughs> yeah there's lots of different there's lots of different you know people like me at the end of the day people if people like music that's great you know what, what they can listen to whatever they want it's great um but yeah i think it's you've probably met the people who are really into music but yes we've been so lucky in the uk because we just got 
music from all over the world um yeah. and i guess out in australia it had to be imported yeah. in that's probably why there was so little of it and Absolutely. an interest for it to buy it yeah i used to order things um I, you know i'd have to go into the record store and it was all done by hand back then and it was like you know they'd send a i don't know how but they'd have to send a physical piece of paper over to the usa yeah say this record store in australia wants this record and then you'd hopefully it'd arrive in australia one day and then they'd call you up on the phone which wasn't your mobile phone which was your home phone yeah <laughs> and say we've got the fat boys interview picture disc that you ordered in, Feb in february and this is a true thing um, i should have i should have pulled that one out um and you know it's now september so it's right. like six six months later and then by that stage you're like what oh okay yeah so you go down and grab this record and then it's but because of that process it becomes such a prized possession yeah um because you remember those those processes that you went through just to get a record yeah. and it's it's a bit of history isn't it <clears throat> i keep <clears throat> excuse me i keep saying this about records they are a piece of history aren't they and they're a tangible oh, piece yeah. of history because they've been pressed at a particular time they've been played a set amount of times and you know my copy of something isn't going to sound the same as yours because it might have been played more at yours and less at mine and and that's True. part of vinyl djing isn't it you can hear it um but no that's doubt, why there is no this doubt. real connection with these records that we buy and, and mate i think that's one of the reasons why i've always been such an advocate um of the vinyl format and for me i've always felt like you know i i did lots of lots and lots of mixtapes um heaps of mixtapes but it, for me, it was always like, if it's not on vinyl, you don't even own that. It was like, yeah. And that's, for me, it was like, anytime I wanted to produce or make a mix or whatever, if I hadn't, if it's not on wax, it doesn't even count for me. <laughs> that's yeah. just the way I've always felt about it. Um, vinyl's yeah. king, always will be. Um, and yeah, you're right. Like some of those records that you've played so many times, it's like, you know, every, you know, when that little bit's coming up that might be a bit worn out or it might skip or hopefully it doesn't skip on this setup, but yep. you know, you have some of those records that have those skips where it like, it only skips on certain setups. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, depending on how good the setup is or how well you balance your, your decks and your, and your needles and whatever. So, um, yeah. That's yeah, part yeah. of the fun, isn't it? You know, <laughs> it's that it's, little bit of, it's, it's that little bit of risk. <laughs> you know it's um no no reward without risk right it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. i'm gonna play it i know there's a chance here it's gonna skip but, but i want to play this yeah. particular record this particular copy because it's mine and yeah cool yeah, especially okay the old ones yeah the special ones that you've had for a while that you really treasure and you're like oh, it's a yeah. beat up record but yeah i'm just gonna like boost the mids and highs and see how we go and you know <laughs> exactly uh, a couple of comments from the chat we've got matt flynn we're talking about records and he says they are literally a record so <laughs> that is that. perfect uh the real commando is saying risks for the skips so that's good True and as that. double p says defo no sync so <laughs> there you go um cool so you're obviously buying records when does it get to the point where you're actually starting to dj out yeah okay so i got my 1200s in 98 um and i put out my first mixtape in about 99 um which was like uh it wasn't all old or new it was a bit of a mix of new and old all hip-hop i think one side was all electro 80s sort of stuff and um the other side was like stuff that i was getting into at the time a lot of like cubert mixmaster mike um but mixed in with some classic old school stuff like run dmc i think there was stuff from the crush groove um, soundtrack on there there was even like i think there was a bit of mad dr x um who's a uk guy um i think he goes under another name as well um but yeah um i probably should have had that tape and could have been read out the track list but yeah look um so i started putting out mixtapes for a few years and didn't really start doing my first gigs wasn't really confident didn't really know what i was doing and like i said i didn't really have a mentor so i just was like uh i, I learned how to line up the beats and mix okay um I had a couple of DJ Rectangle Battle records. Like, I could do some basic sort of really 80s style cuts. Um, but I didn't really have... Um, I didn't really have the sort of collection where I was confident to go out and play in front of an audience yet because my right. st my, my taste was so specific and it was mostly 80s rap. 
So if you didn't like eighties rap, then you, <laughs> weren't, be in trouble. you, know, you weren't going to like my set. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I had to get into a lot of the newer sort of, um, uh, that early 2000s stuff. era. Yeah. Like, um, just sort of, you know, all the, a lot of the 12 inch remixes of like native tongues and just, you know, those sort of yeah. J five sort of records and, um, you know, whatever it might be crafty cuts or just anything that was sort of like funky that, you know, there was that definitely that movement in that time of just, um, you know, getting people dancing to hip hop style sort of beats. Um, so I just had to sort of beef up my collection with, with a bit of that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, that was sort of from about 2000 till about 2004 just finding my feet in Brisbane, um, which uh, for those in the UK who probably don't know, I'm in um, Queensland, which is sort of northern part of Australia. Um, Melbourne is right at the bottom of Australia, so couldn't be further away. And then, yeah, in 2004, I moved um, to Melbourne for about five years um, with my wife and we weren't, we weren't married then, but... Um, we decided that, you know, she, she's an artist, she's a, a vocalist and an MC, and um, we'd put out an album together. Um, I'd done the cuts and she, she had producers come in and, um, yeah, we decided that Melbourne was going to be the place where we could get a bit more uh, work. I'll oh, just, you know, just do more live gigs. It was hard yeah. in Brisbane. There was literally two places that you could play hip hop. Um, right. And, and if you weren't in the cool club of those guys who were like holding that down, literally on lock like they wouldn't let any other djs in or whatever so if you were new and right. coming and you weren't in that little click you wouldn't get any gigs and trying to be a hip-hop dj in brisbane in the early 2000s was was damn near impossible so um yeah spent the next five years in melbourne um and yeah that was that was really mind-blowing because um the quality of djing was just like out of this world um so go and see guys like you know Agent 86 and J Red and um, some of these just absolute boss DJs who've been doing it for a lot longer. And obviously the scene was a lot healthier down there. So they had a lot more access to, you know, the records and the knowledge and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, to go down there was a bit eye opening because I was like, I thought I was all right. And then I go to Melbourne and I'm like, yeah, I'm probably still just, you know, six out of 10. Look, I've, got a, I've got a fair way right. to go here. Um, so yeah, it was a lot of, um, you know, I mean, did that spur you on though, you know, sort of seeing that and seeing what you had to get to, to be able to get those gigs, did that spur you on to sort of go away and sort of practice and get into it more? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I've got to shout out to Danny cool. Um, he was one of the first people I met in Melbourne, um, who really just embraced me and was like, I gave him my mixtape and he was like, yeah, come and do a couple of gigs with me. And I feel like, you know, you're only ever one person away from meeting someone who can literally change your life. Um, yeah. And da da ironically, we both ended up moving back to Brisbane. Well, he moved back, to, he moved to Brisbane from Melbourne and that's, a, that's unheard of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That'd be like, I don't know. Yeah. Moving from something where, somewhere where everything's going on to somewhere where there's not much going on. But um, yeah. Danny's yeah. still a dear friend of mine and um, I saw him on the weekend and, you know, um, I was going to help him move a table somewhere. So this is a guy who I just literally passed the mix mixtape to 20 years ago. And, you know, I saw him on the weekend. So, you know, we formed great relationships. And he was one of those people who really got me involved in the Melbourne DJ scene and started offering me gigs. And we, we started a night together. And we would get some of the guests who were better, better profile DJs than us to come along and do guest yeah. sets and that sort of stuff. So, and that sort of got us in networking with some of those guys and playing some better gigs like yeah that. i mean that's so, that's yeah. how you sort of build isn't it you know you sort of put on a night and then obviously if you can get a budget and you've got support you then book a dj who you'd like to you know aspire to um Definitely. and it's and it's just great and then you do build these networks don't you and it is about community and obviously yeah, some yeah, of the yeah. greatest friends you're ever going to have are probably friends you've made through music over a long cool. period of time like you're saying you know it's it's such yeah. a powerful powerful thing it really is. Um, and like the, one of the things I forgot to mention is um, part of my involvement in the hip hop culture, like the community side of it was always based around the B-Boys. So when I was in Brisbane, um, because I couldn't get many club gigs, I was DJing for a lot of the B-Boy crews. Um, right. Gra Gravity Warriors um, was one of these uh, DJ crews, um, B-Boy crews in Brisbane um, that I started 
became the DJ for. And um, yeah, we got to support Grandmaster Flash at the arena wow. in Brisbane yeah. in 2003 or something like that. Uh, Might have been Amazing. 2002. Um, so my connection to the whole hip hop DJ b-boy community was really strong and i think that's sort of and i i think a lot of hip-hop guys go guys and girls go that way because it's like it's definitely the grassroots thing because you know i would just we we would manage to get funding from the council to just put on little little gigs in Brisbane cool. city um so i would just rock down with some powered speakers and my decks and start playing vinyl and all the b-boys would come down and yeah it was more of a b-boy dj connection um and um, the odd dj would come down as well but it was definitely um the b-boy connection that was um and i've always found those guys to just be the nicest people like with no ego and they just do it purely yeah. for the love there's none of this on, you know, on this or that, like their old DJs. It's just like the B-Boys are just the purest essence of hip hop. You know, they just love it and they just get out, put their bodies on the line, just go yeah. to the music. And I, just to I entertain people. Any, I never had any moves and I would just, like, right. I'd be trying to DJ and there'd be dudes like, you know, popping and spinning in front of me and I'd just be like, oh man, I can't even concentrate. I just... <laughs> I just yeah, chuck on something, chuck on a seven minute version of Apache and just just watch for a minute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's it, yeah, definitely. I'm I'm going down to uh, DJ at Funk Attic in a week or so's time, and they've got loads of breakers and loads of dancers. So again, I'm trying to find funk and breaks and stuff like that. Um, but it is the essence of it, isn't it? You know, that's where hip hop sort of came yeah. from, um, and it's amazing that it's still so popular now. You know, we're in 2023, and it's probably as popular if not more popular than it's ever been, isn't it? Hip hop and funk and all these samples and reversions mm -hmm. and re-edits of old music and combining all sorts of stuff. You know, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? it yeah. And it's really one of those uh, things where, you know, like hip hop is, as we all know, it's just built on sampling and, you know, all these other different genres. Um, and yeah, like that's, that's what I loved about it. You know, it didn't have to be a hip hop track. It could just be something with a heavy beat um tom jones or whatever you know yeah um, it doesn't matter like it's cool it's like they'll they'll just get into the groove and the beats and like um that's what makes those jams exciting for me when you throw in that stuff that's um a bit left field but they'll still get down to it and stuff um so yeah um sorry i forgot where we were we're um um in it's getting into djing that. obviously you're yeah. getting gigs down in melbourne and you're doing sort of b-boy gigs and, and things like that well maybe right. if we move on a little bit to sure. um production i mean when, when does production sort of fit into this when do you start with that excellent okay so this is perfect because this is right where we're up to as well so oh, amazing um, get, <laughs> i've done this to, before <laughs> yeah yeah it's not your first rodeo um we get to like 2007 um so i've been in melbourne for a few years and um I've, um, well, the production goes back a few years before that. I started an instrumental production um, band with my best friend from high school, Ben, um, called Brizztronics. And all we ever wanted to do was make music that sounded like DJ Crush and DJ Shadow. So we, just, yep. our, whole, our whole aim was let's make down tempo jazzy breaks, sample the shit out of all of our collections, sampling all this rare jazz and funk and soul and... We put out a couple of EPs that we never did for any other reason than just so we could put out some cool music. Um, so that was 2002 we put out our first EP. Um, I was still in Brisbane back then, so back a little bit. But um, that's where I actually learnt the skills of how to use um, Acid and Soundforge, which <laughs> everyone's right. going to laugh at me. I still <clears throat> use it. <laughs> I mean, it, you know what? 20, <laughs> it's interesting because a lot of producers come on and they say the same thing, you know, that they found something that works for mm -hmm. them and then they're still able to produce many years later, you know, and that shows the mastery of the software, doesn't it, really? You just know all the shortcuts. It just feels yeah. like home. It's like putting on an old comfy pair of shoes. It's like every time I'm sitting in the studio now and don't, you know, I messed around with more modern things and other things, but I just was past the point of wanting to learn how to use these programs. I was yeah. just like, no, I just want to get in, get my music on there um, and, and, and chop it all up. And for me, Acid and Soundforge was just, they just synced seamlessly and like for cutting and pacing and making loops and edits and all that sort of stuff was was just amazing so um moving a bit forward um so about 2007 so that's that's where i got my 
you know, my stripes on how to work the, the, the production tools. Um, I was never really into much hardware. Um, I purely, because I was moving around a fair bit and um, in Melbourne it was hard to afford a place to stay. So, you know, we were, every six months the landlord would say, you've got to move because we're renovating or this or that. So I was always just like, okay, I've got my decks and I've got my PC. Um, I had a little four track and I probably had, I had a shitty little drum machine or whatever. But um, yeah, so <coughs> I was just like, okay, I had a lot of virtual kits. I had like 808 kits and like all this sort of stuff that was just, um, you know, wave files of, beautiful beats and stuff and i would just use that and um that's how i would you know put my beats together if i wasn't sampling breaks off vinyl i was just chopping up beats um and yeah in 2007 and i'm gonna hold it up here because here's something i prepared earlier this is my debut let me see hold on i can well, probably solo turn it around slowly that. oh it's it's getting soon. It all right okay. hold on let's do that there you go it's a bit because of my background so yeah. this is called, um, this is my debut 12 from 2007, um, Universal B-Boy Megamix. Um, I did a, a new, I, I updated a version of it um, and I released that a couple of years ago as the B-side to the Soul Flower, which is this record behind me. Um, but yeah, that was the first thing I put out and it's got some instrumental stuff on the other side, which is the Bristronic stuff that I produced. Um, so anyway... This is a uh, story. Sam's yeah. joking, saying that's fucking huge. I think he thinks that's a real record behind you. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a real record, Sam tweaks. <clears throat> it's the artwork for the uh, one I did a few years ago, which, yeah, yeah. anyway. Um, so, yeah, okay, carry so, on. And this this is sort of the irony of life, I guess. So I finally, like, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm going to put out a record. I've always wanted to do it. And like we said before, if it's not on wax, it doesn't count. It's not a thing. So I was like, yep, I'm going to do it. Um, so 2007, I'm completely ready to put out this record. I've got everything together. Um, I submit it to the pressing plant. Um, I think it was getting pressed in check at the time. And then, like, the next day, I found out that um, my wife was pregnant and we were, <laughs> we were going to have, have a boy, and right. which just completely changed my whole life. So in a good way, like, yeah. Um, but yeah, it definitely shifted my focus well away from music. Um, of course. So we ended up moving back to Brisbane because we had all our family and extended family, brothers and sisters, grandparents, yeah, yeah. everyone up here. Um, we ended up coming back to Brisbane and, you know, when I look back at it, it was the best thing I ever did because we were able to afford to buy a house here. Um, you right. Know, and this was 15 years ago. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and, and since then, it's just built the platform because in Melbourne, like, I had to buy a house in Melbourne back then was unheard of. It was so expensive. Um, it still is. It's even more expensive now. But, um, yeah, coming back to Brisbane, um, it definitely, it shelves basically my music career for three years while my while my son was young and we i've got a daughter now as well so i've got two kids um but yeah look that was sort of in in a world where i hadn't have had kids i guess that would have just kept evolving from that release into into yeah. other releases um but for me it was more just like okay well i'm just going to take a pause so um yeah it wasn't until 2015 which was quite a long pause you know seven years yeah. or whatever it was um but that's that's what it takes when you have kids you know you're in the trenches for those first few years and anyone who's got kids will know yeah. how hard it is you're, you're, you can't do anything for yourself <laughs> you yeah, yeah 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 <laughs> you know unless you do it at some stupid time of the night um you just yeah. can't get it done so um i literally it wasn't until the kids were almost in sort of um, preschool kindy where I found that oh I've got a little bit of time again here where I can start working on music and in 2015 I did the Run BST Mega Mix which was okay. the yeah. Run DMC Beastie Boys one and yeah, um, yeah, yeah. it eventually made it to a 7 inch maybe I've got 7 inch yeah, yeah. maybe 2 or 3 years later it, um, I got it onto 7 inch so yeah that's sort of and then we come back up to where we are today so I guess um <laughs> Sideshow can confirm that 100%. Uh, he's got <laughs> a little boy <laughs> and no time for anything. No uh, time for anything. It's no. like, yeah. Sam Tweak says, <laughs> Run BST is mega. And it definitely is. And I think Excellent. I think that's probably the first time you came properly onto my radar, I think, when I got that seven, um, I think. So when you get onto the seven, you... but yeah. yeah. So yeah, so, so 
where'd you go from there? Well, that's when, you know, I sort of got to the point. Um, now, the 7-inch was a little, we're going ahead a bit. A little bit later, yeah, it yeah, wasn't, yeah. It wasn't actually my debut 7-inch, but no, I, did no. put run, I did put the Run BST Mega Mix out on a 12-inch. Um, I did 100 copies, and right. I eventually sold them all, but I didn't sell most of them until after I'd been putting out my 7s, and I got a bit of... Um, a bit of acknowledgement for that. So um, yeah, yeah. it was very much a case of like, oh, I've pressed 100 or 150 of this record. I sold 20 to my mates. <laughs> now I've got 120 records. What am I going to do with them? But yeah. look, I'm a persistent person. Like I was like, I've been on this journey for so long. I'm not just going to go, oh, I didn't sell any of this. So I'm going to stop now. It was like, look, I'm just going to keep going. And um, yeah, you're going to yeah. keep going, aren't you? You're going to keep going. Yeah. And it's sort of, it, to get into the seven inch realm was more a, a case of like, I started noticing the portableism yeah. scene just really kicking off. And I just thought, oh, I'd, I'd done the, I'd done the um, back in hell. Where is it? see that this is a seven inch but that's i think that's the one that's when i first Wait, uh I'm came to my radar it so it doesn't let me try let me oh, move you oh there you go let me move you across that's and then better. we can solo you there you go well well okay cool yeah yeah Just look at how tired i look it's still early <laughs> it's so early there anyway, that's the back in hell um yeah i think the original the original was um a jukebox cut hole on it but um yeah so look it was um that was 2018 when i dropped that on seven inch but i did that mix i think the year before so that was sort of only a year or two after run bst so my whole ethos on production was always like i just love the mega mix and you know growing up listening to the mantronics mega mixes and the two live crew mix mr mix um dj shadow the lessons steinsky yeah 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 for me, like the Mega Mix was just like the ultimate cool thing for a DJ to do because you know you've you've got music that's released, but then you think that's the last step, but it's like no, nah, hang on a minute, the DJs are getting in here, yeah, and doing it, putting another layer on it, and then putting it out again. So for me, um, I didn't even think of doing like edits and remixes until you know a few years later. Because I saw that that was sort of a thing that people were buying, but um, yeah, if you if you check out, you know, this this mega mix, it's like there's it's awesome. The, <laughs> well, the, the the proper version goes for seven minutes. Um, it's available yeah. on digital, and I'd never I only did like ten or twelve copies of a live cut uh twelve inch of that with the actual longer version. But if you like the back in hell mega mix, check it out on Bandcamp because the full seven minute version's up there on digital. Um, so yeah, I released that a few, a bit before, um, the seven inch, um, and what really kicked it off for me there was, um, my good friends, um, at Hip Hop Gods, um, managed to get it into the hands of, um, Chuck D, who heard it and, you know, put it on his Facebook page yeah. and his Twitter and, and there was this, and there was then the sticker, wasn't there, with yeah. Chuck D's quote, wasn't there on the yeah. record? Yeah. yeah, and I haven't mentioned PE yet, but obviously one of my favourite bands. I mean, anyone who's into hip hop, you know, if you don't know about Public Enemy, then it, you, yeah, you I mean, pretty much here. every yeah every yeah, every to, guest I've had, <laughs> yeah, every guest I've had who's, who's come in through hip hop has name checked Public Enemy. It's amazing how many people mm. influenced you know so much you know and, and everyone in the same way. Um, cool production, the Bomb Squad. I mean, yeah. Oh my God! Like yeah, just. Um, so there's three albums around that time, you know, Paul's Boutique, um, you know, the Dela debut, uh, Three Feet High and uh, Nation of Millions and also Bum Rush's show, but not so much to an extent, but really just cemented my love for sampling and just, you know, just the, the I don't know, the ethos of like taking other people's music and putting it out as your own and taking those risks and being prepared to, you know, take the consequences it's like it's not legal it's not legit but i'm gonna do it anyway because i love music and this is an art form and i'm an artist yeah and i'm gonna make this and i'm gonna put it out and cool if they want to come at me and say oh you stole this bit of our record cool i did yep i admit it here's my 50 bucks that i've made off it or whatever yeah exactly um, that, that's, so, the, yeah, that's I've been, mm, the thing isn't it i've been really influenced by just um that sort of hip-hop ethos of um just taking risks and you know just 
be like, well, that's hip hop culture. That's graffiti. You know, you're writing on someone's wall, and it's like it's art, and it's it's not completely legit, and not everyone's going to agree with it, but it's definitely you know a part of culture and it's part of art. And um, for me, sampling and um, making mega mixes and just doing my own doing my own stuff like that, and just wearing my heart on my sleeve and saying, look. I'm not a producer. I'm not a mu- I'm I'm not I am a producer, but I'm not a musician. I'm, yep. I'm I know how to sample though cuz every record I've listened to since I was 12 has had samples in it. So I'm going to make sample based music and I'm going to put it out and I'm going to start taking risks and ma- you know experimenting with different stuff. Yeah. It's important. And it's, it's important. Mm. And it's also you just never know what it's going to be what it's going to produce, isn't it? You know, if we could never sample anything or never create something new, it just wouldn't it would just stop because music you know has evolved because people have, have, have sampled music and then they've played something slightly differently and then they've gone to this country and it, it's just the way sort of music is isn't it it's so interesting now isn't it isn't it great seeing all of all the bands doing you know modern versions of songs yeah. that were sampled and, yeah um, the know, reversions like, yeah you know Soul supreme and everything exactly like yeah it's, yeah it's, it's it's so cool because, like, you know, as a kid, you would never have, like, imagined that, like, a real band is going to be playing this Wu-Tang song. One yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, they're not. <laughs> yes, they are. But it's not going to be till 2023, 30 yeah. years after the yeah. record's out, and it's gained, it's been in the public realm for 30 years, and it's finally been accepted as popular culture because back, you know, you know how it was in the 90s, yeah. like, hip hop was so underground and um, just, you know, it didn't get the respect in a lot of ways it deserved. Um, but now it's like, oh, well, hip hop's been pretty shit for the last 10 years. So let's look back at all the cool stuff. Um, and yeah, I feel like I, I, I just love seeing like bands like, you know, the there's so many now. I can't even name them all. But, I know, it's amazing. Know, the bands it? doing, doing reversions of um, classic grooves. Um, the, yeah, you know, yeah. Like, the, like, yeah. Like, you know, you've got the Traffic of you as well and uh, Bacow. Oh, yeah, um, And, mm. you know, all those sort of levels. Um, Ed Bond makes a good point. There's only seven notes. Everything gets reused and referenced, and that's just as it should be. So there you go. That. You know. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool. Agreed. So. Agreed. I think obviously you're producing, you're getting stuff putting out. Um, what, where are we sort of at in um, yeah, Back to so Hell? When I, did that come out? I, I think um, we're, but we're, we're sort of up to Back in Hell now. So um, yeah. this was five, I, I just posted on my Insta the other day. It's actually the five year release. Yeah, 2018, DJ Bacon, Brisbane, Australia. Full five years. Version, blah, blah, blah. Um, five years almost to the day. So. Um, that really sort of kicked it off. Um, and I, I always shout out money shot because <laughs> when <coughs> I release, when I release and, um, big ups to Roy, um, when I release that seven inch, I didn't know I wasn't connected in any of the scene or the vinyl or whatever. I'd, I'd only just had my Bandcamp page for like a year and I'd only sold like three things. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. Oh, I'm going to release this seven inch and just put it on Bandcamp and see what happens. And yeah, money, money shot is a dude. <laughs> I agree. And he's um, a, yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah. I'd, I'd sold probably 10 or 20 in Australia. And I was like, yeah, oh, yeah, this is just going down the usual path of like, you know, I've got my little 20 fans here. And then, um, yeah, I think Roy posted it on, um, uh, I'm not sure what channel it was or how he got the word out there, but, um, I woke up one morning and I'd sold like 60 copies to the UK. And right. Like, this is absurd. Like, <laughs> I can't understand what's happened here. And um, yep. he'd posted it somewhere. I wish I had more details. Sorry, Roy. I'm, and um, yeah, I just, um, that sort of kicked it off for me. And at that point I was like, I hadn't even sent any vinyl overseas really. I'd sent a couple of things, but yeah, yep. I was like, that's the start of the soul the whole last five years of my life, which have been absolutely manic, like bonkers, <laughs> hacking so many records every week. Um, I yeah. literally have to dedicate, depending on how busy it's been and how many wholesale orders I've got. But yeah, um, you know, my whole life is now just producing, packing records, sending records, um, and trying to make sure that, you know, anyone who buys a record of me gets a great product and is happy and, you know, shipping from Australia has so many disadvantages. Yeah. That's, I'm that's like, the, that's your, well, what probably one of your biggest problems, isn't it? Um, it's a mass, it's a massive hurdle in COVID, for instance, I yeah. couldn't, po- I, I stopped shipping to the UK 
because yep. there weren't enough flights going there. And I think what was happening, the records were just sitting on tarmacs, probably in Australia, <coughs> in, you know, 40 degrees. Melting, heat, yeah. Melting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I sent um, Smooth bought a couple of my things. And I, actually, it was this record behind me, that, um, the Soulflower one. Um, yeah. I had to send it to him three or four different times. And he showed me a photo of it, and That's literally the, 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 the grooves were melted off the record. Like, it was like, yeah. there was this clear spot on the record where there was no grooves. Like, it had That's just been <laughs> copying bonkers. direct, probably just copying direct sun for a week or something. Who knows? But there weren't enough flights yep. going, so, like, the records were just sitting on the tarmac. And, yeah, look, it's been a massive process trying to get my packing game right you know it's yep. been hard um probably one of the biggest challenges for me um and especially the cost of shipping as well yeah is not ideal and that's all gone up um so yeah i'm sort of um going into another rabbit hole here but i might as well keep going with it for a minute <laughs> so, yeah go for it no um, no because the, these are all in, interesting things and, and behind the scenes and people don't know what mm, it takes and, to get that record to you oh, to get that record it's, from australia it's still bonks isn't it you are able to send me a physical product yeah, I know mean, it's it's you know, like that, old... you know send that to me and it get here from all the other yeah. side of the world. Um, hopefully, hopefully flat. <laughs> yeah, hopefully flat. Yeah, <laughs> I've had some not from you. I have had some from Australia. New records mm. that just came in, and as soon as I put mine, it's just like it's just like almost a bowl. It was ridiculous. It's such um, a shame. And but yeah, and I feel I feel for the producer and the, and the the yeah. record label. That's the thing. So yeah, so so go on, carry on, carry on yeah, down. Yeah. So what I'm hole. trying to do now is so if someone buys a couple of records off me, like a couple of sevens, it's like, I know what weight category I can sort of, I know what, what it's going to cost yeah. to, to send those. And I know how much weight I can actually fit into that, um, fit into that package. So if, um, you know, if the records are only going to weigh 200 and I can pack up to 250, I'll make sure that it's just filled with lots of cardboard and lots of insulation and obviously yep. just wrapped as best and proper as, properly as I can to keep it under that weight and also make sure that it's um, going to arrive safely. Um, and just, yeah, spending, I've just got to spend more money and get really good mailers and boxes and all that sort of things. And that's, you know, obviously taking a chunk out of my profits, but that, that doesn't yeah. matter. To me, it's all about like, I just want people who are into my staff to just get good flat copies and be able to dj with them because that's you want to you want to get the records to the right people um and to the people who want them who are then going to be able to use them and play them out you know that's what you're out and then it's people like who's done this oh, it's a dj bacon record you know that's so good that's but what like, what the main it's all about isn't it mate the support i've had from the uk has been phenomenal and ev everyone over there um who's ever bought one of my things i just i want to tip my hat to you and say thank you um because yeah it's really just kept me inspired to just keep going with it and um yeah even like for juno to just sort of you know invest in me and say look we're we're gonna buy lots of stuff off you as well because for me like like we said the challenges of posting stuff individually has yep. just been like you know it's tiresome and it's it's repetitive and it's like this cycle of like oh i didn't get a flat record blah 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 so yeah um it's just selling lots of chunks of stuff to juno is like it's not ideal um but it's good that i can get my records over there and out there yeah um and the other thing I was going to touch on is just in the last six months, Bandcamp has made the VAT tax and the GST compulsory, which it right. never used to be. It never used to be compulsory. You, you used to be yeah. able to not charge it if you didn't want to. Um, right. So it's been, yeah, the last six months particularly, <clears throat> like the, the overseas sales have just like halved purely because Bandcamp's now making these taxes compulsory. So... For yeah. me, it's just another hurdle. I'll get over it. I'll work a way around it. Um, I'm trying to deal with most of my customers directly. Um, and so yeah, and that, everyone... that's the best way, isn't it? It's almost almost cutting out the middleman, isn't it, really? Um, um, yeah, that's, you know, that's what I'm trying to do. And at the end of the day, so... if you can, um, but again, it's it's sending two, three, four, whatever, you know, it, it's easier to sell, send one whole chunk, isn't it, and then distribute at the other end. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, that's what I've, one of the good things that I've got going for me now is I've got such a catalogue now, so I've probably put out yep. like 30, 30, 7 inches or something like that. So if people look at my band camp, they can go, oh, you know, I've got these, but I don't have these. So if they buy four or five or I'm doing these one kilo packs now, which is like okay. you get you get like 10 records um, 
and the shipping's not that much more. It's like only thirty five bucks instead of twenty. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm I'm doing it at a really good price. So look, if anyone wants vinyl off me, just hit me up direct on Instagram. Get in touch. Yeah. 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 And look, I'll I'm just I'm I'm not even all about making the money. I'm just like I just want you to have my records. So I'm just cutting really good deals to people who deal with me directly. So yeah, if you want to yeah, yeah. hit me up direct, you um, heard it here yeah. first. Yeah, hit up <laughs> DJ Baker directly. <laughs> um cool okay well let's move forward to sort of just before the pandemic uh because we obviously are going to talk about mental health um but just before the pandemic uh what were you doing and when the pandemic hit how did that change yeah good call um so i've been a working dj you know most of my life um so back to you know when before before the pandemic hit i was probably djing maybe four nights a week um playing at a lot of different venues where i was i had a couple of really good gigs that i liked like at a couple of breweries where i was just playing like really good funk and soul and hip-hop and reggae and you know good music um but to make ends meet i would always have to do a couple of crappy gigs playing not so much top 40 but definitely playing to you know 20 something year olds who want to hear stuff that they know and they want to hear it yep, now. Yep. And they, they don't want to hear a four minute version of it. They want to hear a one minute version of it. Like we yep. said. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> we were talking about that before, weren't we? Yeah. yeah. Like just, and most of you guys listening will know the grind of um, a working DJ. Um, you know, it's always such a blessing when you can get, um, get, get and do gigs where, you know, you enjoy it. Um, you've got audience who enjoy it. And I've just found, you know, playing to a sort of 40 plus audience now is just like shooting fish in a barrel for me. Like everyone loves it. I love it. Everyone's having a good yep. time. It's brilliant. But so before the pandemic, I was still had to make ends meet by doing a couple of gigs um, at sort of, you know, rooftop bars and things like that in Brisbane that were like, you know, just I had to play a bit more house and a bit more dance and disco and top 40 R&B, which is not all terrible. But um, yeah, it was when the pandemic hit, it was like, um, obviously we, I don't know how you guys went over there, but I lost every single gig. There was no more gigs. Um, yeah. 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 It was. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it wasn't like, Oh, I've still got this one thing. I like, it was like, nah, you've gone from like everything you've worked your whole life for yeah. to be a working DJ has just been pulled out from underneath you. And now, um, the question I was going to ask, uh, Christos, was did you guys get any sort of government support for artists who, you know? Um, I think there was some eventually. There was some eventually, um, mm. but it took a lot to get there, and I don't think it was quite enough compared to that. And and there seemed to be, certainly here, the rhetoric that, oh, just go and get an, a proper job, you know, <laughs> in, in a way yeah. they were trying to say to artists, you know, well, you know, if you can't do that anymore, go and get a proper job, or like, you know, do this, that, and the other. So, yeah, they weren't really looked after as well as they should have been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we were we were lucky in a sense that like we did um, have this job keeper thing that came out for anyone who was a, like a registered business had their own business right um, so but that took a while to kick in obviously and yeah. it, it wasn't the same it was like half of what we were earning sort of thing so look when the pandemic hit i was like okay well it's time to go back to the drawing board and think about how i'm gonna you know how i'm gonna make money basically um and i was lucky enough that you know i'd already had my my feet in the game in terms of the production i'd already put yep. out a couple of sevens and already had an audience uh to some to some degree um so when the pandemic hit i was like and look i'll be honest i was in a i was in a pretty dark spot because i think and, and a lot of artists were because we'd lost all our we'd lost all our work um but one of the hardest things was the homeschooling we had to like i don't know yeah you guys had to do. <laughs> all of a sudden i'm like at home with my two kids every day and I've got no gigs, nothing to look forward to on the weekend. <laughs> um, and I was just, yeah, look, I, and I'm not the only one, but I was, I was, you know, mentally a bit messed up. And, um, yeah. that's, that's when I was sort of like, Oh, I just need something artistic and creative that I can sink my teeth into. That's a little bit dark and a little bit challenging and just, you know, it's gonna, so that's when the beastie Floyd, that's when I decided that I was going to do the beastie Floyd thing. Um, and the reason why is because my brother, when we were little, <laughs> his favorite band was Pink Floyd and my favorite band was Run DMC. And we used to just yep. give each other a terrible time saying, 
my band's so much better than your band. Like, Beast, <laughs> Beast, you know, Beastie Boys and Run DMC, they're so much better than um, Pink Floyd and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And that's just, you know, dad stuff and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> fast, forward tw- fast forward 20 years and... Um, yeah. I'm a music lover of all genres and yeah, yeah. I, I, I couldn't avoid Pink Floyd because my brother was like always playing it. So I already knew all the songs and all the albums and Animals was always one of the coolest. Like that song Dogs by Pink Floyd, which didn't actually make it into the mix, but um, you know, uh, yeah. the wall, the wall, especially, um, yeah. First time I ever smoked weed, I was about 14 and my brother played me the wall, the movie. And if anyone's seen Pink Floyd, the wall, the movie, it's like, <laughs> it's basically a bad horror movie, but it's so dark yeah. and twisted. And I still, I still have, um, PTSD about that movie for some reason. I'm just like, Pink Floyd, it's like, it's, just, I, I just, it, I don't know. It just resonates to me in a dark way, especially that movie and the album a bit. But anyway, I just was like, okay. I just want to try something. I'm going to try and mix Pink Floyd and Beastie Boys because, you know, it. I've got nothing else to do <laughs> except yeah. homeschool. Um, and I started mucking around with it. And like most projects, it didn't, you know, it was a lot of hit and miss. Um, but I just stayed with it and kept at it. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. <laughs> yeah, I agree, Sam. It's it's hard. It's, yeah. a, it's a funny one. Um, but yeah, but I guess I, you're um, doing it. You know, you, you've sort of said that you've done it. You, you needed a project, effectively, um, yeah. and you're doing it because you needed something to deal with the mental aspect of the fact that all your gigs have sort of fallen apart. Um, 100%. And you yeah. don't know. And also, there was that element of you just didn't know when anything was going to come back. Yeah, you know, and, um, it, like you're like, is this it? You know, is this going to be it for forever now? You know, are we going to be locked up inside our houses? You know, it took a long time before vaccines and stuff kicked in, didn't it? It was a good year or so, if not mm. more. Um, so that that's must have been great, difficult as well. That's a great point. Like, um, no one knew when it, when or if it was going to end. Yeah. Um, so I guess you could say that the BC Floyd mix is my end of the world mix. I don't know. <laughs> I <was> like, <laughs> <laughs> is this it? Like, I don't know. But um, yeah, yeah that, that's such a good point. There was so much uncertainty in the pandemic, wasn't there? And um, no one really, no one really knew what was going to happen or what was going yeah. on. I just knew I was homeschooling and I was doing a lot of day drinking just to try and cope with it. And uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a good spot. And, um, but yeah. it, it managed to, luckily um filter out through my creativity um and that's sort of yeah that kept me going and like that's what that's what i love about art and you know being an artist is that like you can express yourself through it and um to you know to make something like that um i'm super proud of that like i've just yeah it's sold better than anything else i've ever done i think i think i've sold about like Oh, i won't say because um it's better not to say but I've sold, <coughs> yeah. I've sold a couple you tell a couple. Uh, yeah. Sam Tweaks has got a question, right? <laughs> is the dark side of the moon upside down in Australia? <laughs> um, Bless I him. don't know, mate. I don't know. We, we, we still have the moon um, and it looks, I'd say it looks the same as you guys. It's quite bright. It's not, it's not that dark, but um, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, nice one, Sam. So when, when did that get released? So that was um, 2020. I'm just Okay, yeah, and I guess that. W- hang on a sec. And I guess that was pretty much. If it's 2020, then obviously that is bang during the start of the pandemic, isn't it? So, yes. had you finished that and had it ready to be released, and obviously couldn't get it out because of COVID, or was there pressing plant issues? Um, no, I didn't really have any pressing issues, thankfully, with that one. Um, but yeah, I um, yeah, it took me about three months to make the mix and it's two 10 minute sides but there's a lot in there there's a whole lot of samples and a whole lot of um tracks in there excuse me and um so that probably took about three months and then you know you've got the pressing time which was probably about well well i mean the 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 pressing times hadn't slowed down by that stage yet i don't think it was till like yeah, a year a bit or a bit later that it actually got really hard to press vinyl because i think what had happened is a lot of artists had been you know, making music in the pandemic and wanted to press vinyl and um, all of a sudden everyone was ready to put stuff out. Um, but yeah, yep. the, I obviously had all the supply chain issues as well. So um, getting vinyl and whatnot. But yeah, so that took about three months to make. And then um, 
the first pressing was only 150 copies because like I just was like, well, I was broke because <laughs> like I yep. the job. Um, and then that just moved quickly, and I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna have a crack at 300, and then they moved, and then so on and so on and so on. So um, yeah, and it's um, I, I don't know. I think it's just like a good example of. You, you know, if it's down, you just gotta you just gotta keep plowing through. There's no don't sit around and feel yeah, sick. and it and it must be good because you know you were talking about the sort of music you wanted to make, like the sort of DJ Crush and the sort of DJ Shadow, mm. and this is definitely very sample based. But again, it's it's not quite that sort of introducing sort of album, is it? It's your own twist on it. You're like these two albums, I know I can put together and make really interesting um mm. because you've known them for so long isn't it that that's the key i think the, you, man you, you're spot on the key to anything is knowing the catalog well um, yeah no if you know all the tracks from an artist um it doesn't seem like a chore because it's just a familiar thing that you're putting with another familiar thing um uh, yeah 100 percent um I'm working on a, a Trouble Funk mega mix at the moment. I'm, and I haven't okay. done a mega mix for a few years. So this is the next thing I'm working on at the moment. And for me, it's just, it doesn't feel, it's never, I mean, making music never feels like work really. But for me, this has just been like such a, such a easy process because I know the, the catalog of Trouble Funk so well. Um, and it's just, yeah, like I said, it's just the way it goes. It's like, you know, if you know the artist's work, then um, it's it's quite easy to just think of ideas and know the bridges and the choruses and, you know, you know little bits that might match up with the other thing and that's what I'm always looking for, yeah. Yeah. We were talking before um, about during the pandemic and you were sort of being told that, oh, everyone's streaming, you should sort of get on and do the streaming, but you sort of went your own way and decided to do more of the production didn't you um just talk us through that process so so what was it that mm. stopped you necessarily i'm not gonna say jumping on the bandwagon but you know sort of getting into streaming during the pandemic when everyone else was yeah good good call um so look i've never been one to follow trends as such and I, you know i don't want to sound like a like conceited or whatever but um i'm always trying to like do experimental things and just do things that challenge me and i'm not too concerned about the consequences necessarily um yeah. i'm obviously not going to do things that are going to just you know waste a lot of time and money i still want to make sure it's worth my while but um yeah for me it's very much a case of like um i didn't really want to um follow the trends as such because i could see every single dj i knew everyone was jumping on twitch everyone was streaming everyone was doing live DJ sets, et cetera, et cetera. And um, don't get me wrong, like I DJ still like lots. I'm a great, I don't wanna say I'm a great DJ. I'm, I'm a competent DJ, <laughs> I've been doing yep. it for a while. I've, I've, I've got the skills, I can juggle, I can scratch, I can do it all. I don't really find like that's where I'm at at the moment. Yeah, like, yeah. If, I, if it had been, if the pandemic had been five years previous, I was so into like cutting and scratching and juggling and just being a badass hip hop DJ back then that I probably would have jumped on Twitch and been like, look what I can do. Um, yeah. But yeah, I've never been one to follow trends and I felt like every single DJ is on Twitch doing this, doing that. And, uh, you know, good on them. Every, you know, choose your own adventure. That's fine. Like everyone yeah, can yeah. do what they want. And um, I'm, I'm glad. And look at, look, at what, look, look at what it's become now and how how awesome it's been for the scene and the community and yeah, yeah. everyone together. Um, but for me, I just wasn't in that place. I was like, I'm getting really into my production. I'm yeah. not in a good headspace. Um, and yeah, I really just knuckled down and was like, I'm going to do this Beastie Boys Pink Floyd thing. And, um, you know, like I said, I spent a while doing it and getting it out there. And um, it was really well received. And maybe it was well received because you could sort of hear the sort of the, the darkness in it, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, um, I feel like one day I will get on and start streaming and doing that Twitch thing. Um, and look, I, I see what you guys do and I, I, I sort of pick up on it and I watch a little bit here and there i'm mostly just on stories on, on um yeah yeah on instagram um i don't even i don't even have a, a twitch account to be honest um but look um it's cool isn't it great that you guys can all just connect with all the djs around the world and this, what you've done with your show? i mean we, we, we were saying at the beginning of the show you know the, the you know the fact that we can even do this that we can you know you're in australia i'm here we can have this conversation and talk to each other and then obviously we've got our friends and people in the community who are also 
in the room and able to sort of make comments and stuff um like the real dj commander you know he's saying he's loving the 45s movement and i, mm. I think it it is a bit of a movement um in that i think we've moved on a little bit from right let's just let's just play records you know we're having these conversations you know there's lots more producers coming in and doing 45 specific records so it, i think it is a movement and it's all really positive no doubt it's definitely a movement um yeah i feel like i was lucky enough to sort of like i said with that back in hell one it was more of just a punt and a, a and a bit of a, a guess really i was like oh well, everyone's doing these um you know like i said the portableism movement was moving and i was like yep. well i'm just gonna have a crack and put out a 45 and see how it goes um and yeah i just feel like i reckon one of the main things has been you know a lot of 40 40 something year olds like us yeah um we don't want to carry around big bags of 12 inches anymore right? yeah yeah <laughs> <So> yeah <laughs> that's one of the main advantages of sevens and obviously like the better sound quality because um you know the spinning faster and all those sort of things that, that about it but um you know it's definitely been for me there's a few things that have made 45s really kick off um twitch has been one of them um you know this the the slip mats like i can see in front of you there like the dusty donuts ones yep, the, recess, yep. the, the recession for the labels there um the, the, the amazing Def jam the, you know, the, the next thing was gonna say yeah, like, yeah. The, the amazing um sid def jam and um short shot style adapters that actually lock the 45s into place um all that stuff and also like obviously the the, the amount of content that's coming out now that is um not your traditional, you know, 10 years ago, if you were playing a 45, it was probably had to be an original version that didn't sound that good and was underproduced and was, <coughs> I mean, that's, that's a br bad generalization, but you know what I mean? Like now, if you want to play like, you know, stuff that sounds a bit fatter, um, you can get it on 45 and, um, you can get good edits that are easier to mix and blend and cut with the, you know, locked intros and outros and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah. Um, it's just, yeah. And maybe it was meant to be. <laughs> Well, we, we were talking a little bit about this, you know, the, the pandemic pandemic was terrible, you know, and obviously it's still having an impact and a lot of people died. But there, there did seem to be a push and, and people who were creative, like ourselves, all seemed to find our creative niches in what we wanted to do. Um, and it sort of pushed us into getting more creative with what we had, mm. wasn't it? And I guess with you, you know, so it gave you that impetus to get that record out or, or get that record made. Mm. Um and also we talk a lot about when we're doing a DJ set on Twitch, it's a bit like music therapy because for that hour or two hours, you're just concentrating on DJing and the people there. It's the same with production, I guess. Once you're in it, mm. you can't really think of anything else. So maybe that came across as well, sort of a bit of the music so, therapy. So true. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the music therapy, definitely, like I said, you know, when you're in the pandemic, like, you know, just if you're playing with music, it's something that soothes your soul a bit. Um, but yeah, you're spot on there about, um, you know, it's just one of those things where like, um it's you know it's just it's a beautiful thing and um you know everyone's got their own way of doing it and interpretate interpreting it um but for me like to be in the production headspace and then try and move right over to the dj headspace and be do a yep. really good clean dj set is a difficult thing um yeah so for me i'm not um i'm not so much focused on being a performance dj but years ago i thought that's what i wanted to be um i'm much more happy being in my studio um living in this beautiful part of queensland that's sunny five days out of seven <laughs> you'll be sad to know <laughs> right <laughs> um and just you know enjoying the space and um being able to work in my own sort of time frame and schedule to make music that i want to do the way that i want to do it um and that for me at the moment is production um and look a lot of my a lot of my peers and family and friends are, are saying to me at the moment you need to do a tour tour the world and just do a set of all your seven inches um yeah man and to do that i'd love to do it and i probably will do it one day but i i wouldn't want to do that without spending a good sort of six months on the decks again and yeah, getting, yeah. My ch getting my chops right back up to the point where i know they can be um yeah because that's what it takes for me a lot. I, I yeah, and it's going to be a show. If, you, if you're if you going to embark on, you know, a, mm. a world tour effectively or traveling to other countries, you know, you want to take a show and it be tight and perfect and, and the best it could be. 
you, you're absolutely spot on. So um, it's hard to just, like I said, it's hard to just switch from spending yep. like three or four hours in the studio every day producing yep. to just jumping on the decks and being like, oh, okay, now I'm going to be still be a badass DJ on the decks. There's still like, um, I'm still, you know, probably eight out of 10 to where I can be, but to get that extra 2% is like, <laughs> it's a lot yep. of hard work. <laughs> um, and to be honest, I just like the comfort of being able to make stuff in the studio because you know, you can just erase all your errors. <laughs> That's what's the good thing about production. It's like, yeah. if it's not perfect, then it doesn't, you know, get rid of that bit and make it perfect, you know? So yeah. yeah, yeah. It's better. yeah, yeah. And um, it's that dedication, isn't it? And making sure it is perfect when you put it out. Mm, mm. Um, so obviously as you, as you're selling more records and obviously putting stuff out and it's getting more of a reach, um, are you finding that the community is growing and that, that you're getting sort of, you know, return buyers and that you're connecting and having networking with other DJs? Absolutely. Um, and producers, yeah, look, of course. Yeah. Um, it's, it's been so cool. Like just being like, like I said, I'm pretty isolated here in Australia. I'm like, you know, there's not a whole lot going on in, in my immediate city. Um, but just constantly um, connecting with people all over the States and the UK and, all over Europe, um, all over the world. And that's the beauty of like, you know, like you said, with Twitch and the, the, the internet and whatever, um, a lot of people, even, you know, France, um, I've, and I'll just make friends along the way because people will be like, oh, I've, I've got this record, I bought it off so-and-so. And it's it's important having the distributors in each country, you know, like um, Bum Rush yep. in, the, in the States and Juno in the UK and um, HHV in Germany and whatnot. So just having... And I've got a place in Japan as well. Um, but just having been able, people might pick up my records, but I haven't dealt with them directly. And then they send me a message, they find me, and then we strike up a conversation. And um, yeah, I feel like that's my community is like the worldwide community. And I like to just um, connect with all these people directly and just, um, yeah, having a great bunch of, um, a great bunch of followers who are, you know, will, continue to buy my stuff and, and appreciate it and love it and man to just get a message from someone on the other side of the world saying they bought your record and they love it and they want another yeah. one or they want to buy one for their friend or something it's like that's yeah. like the, that's the ultimate dream for me that was like that's that's it that's all i care about it's like that's cool like i've you know, my music's making an impact on someone on the other side of the planet. Um, I'm happy with that. I'm not looking it, for any sort of fame or recognition or anything. I just want people to play good music. And if I've had something to do with it, then, you know, I'm stoked. With that. It's, yeah. it's this um, it's this sort of ripple effect as well, isn't it? So obviously you create something. Uh, one person listens to it. That person buys that record. They might be a DJ. They might play it on Twitch. They might play it out. And then that has an impact. So it's getting that bit of music from you to someone else who can then share it with other people, isn't it? That's the, that's the mm. aim to try and spread it and get that mm. message out and the music as, as big as yeah. possible. Yeah. And that's the beauty of the vinyl format really, isn't it? Yeah. Because we're so, we're so passionate about it and we've got to, you know, if you hear something that's dope, you've got to have it on wax and then when yeah. you play it out on wax, it's like, it's just, it's just the ultimate. So yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, just massive thanks to anyone who's ever, you know, bought one of my records, like, you know, it's just amazing to be able to sit here in Brisbane. And I'm really lucky at the moment because, um, it's kicked off so well, like the, the, the selling of my own records that, um, I'm not having to DJ as much anymore. So at yep. the moment I'm just doing one, maybe two gigs a week. And, um, the rest of my income is just coming through selling vinyl. Um, That's great. Which, is, which is a dream come true really. Um, so the the less I have to DJ, the more time I have to, to create produce. and yeah. produce. Um, and it's just this cycle and it's just becoming more fun. And yeah, every day I'm so lucky. I literally drop the kids off at school. Then I have like four or five hours. Well, I have to, I get all my chores done. <laughs> yeah. And then <laughs> still stuff to when, do when you've got a couple of kids and a wife and a family, you've got a few things to do. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I like try to get like three or four hours a day in and every day I'm in the studio. And when I say in the studio, I might just be packing records all day. Yeah. I might just be submitting artwork. I might just be, you know, yeah, all the behind the scenes stuff, isn't it? You know, that you have or, to do. Yeah. Yeah. Or I might actually be right in the middle of a mix or doing yep. something. And that for me is the most fun thing. Apart from other people buying my records and playing them to just have the luxury of being able to spend every day yep. in the studio yep. making music, just grabbing 
you know, stuff from my record collection and, and just doing stuff with it is like the dream. And that's what I've always wanted to do. So look, I'm literally um, very happy. <laughs> that's great. Very that's happy great. How, how it's going. It's yeah. great how it's going. And, and I'm sure it will, it will just carry on and, and yeah, c- just keep, keep putting those records out. You know, people buy his records and then get, keep putting them out and get more and more. And then we'll get to the world tour. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that we do on part of my journey is I ask guests to bring on three 45s that lift their spirits. It's a question that Mark Lancaster asked in the very first episode where he said to people, what 45s lift your spirits? And we've done it ever since. And we've got an uplifting mix as well. But what um, what three have you picked out um, okay. to yeah. talk about? It's it's great that Sam tweaks is in the chat because um, oh, yeah. <laughs> this this record came out. As oh, long as I've got wood. Let me see when so are you. Uh, there it is. Where is it? There it it's is. a Sam Tweaks record. <laughs> and, mate, I've got to say, Sam, like, that for me was such a cool thing to hear because it was literally you just pacing the tracks together. Like, there wasn't a lot of extra production there. Um, and to me, I was just like, it just sort of, like, flicked a switch in my brain. I was like... Yeah, you just find the original and then you find the one with the sample and then you put them together and you put it out on a record. And I was like, yeah, for me, um, and first time I heard it, I didn't quite, I couldn't quite work out exactly what was going on. I was like, oh, this, uh, uh, now, now when I play it, I just love it. And I love how you took the swear, you use the clean versions of the Woo track as well. Um, and yeah, look, I play this at Felons all the time. And when the, when the soul version comes in, um, always gets a reaction and it just it just makes me feel great um because i'm obviously a massive well, i think anyone is in the hip-hop is a massive wu-tang fan but definitely that yeah record particularly just sort of made me think about it all a bit differently where it was like you know okay. it does there's no rules here just you know get the get the original get the other version put them together and see what happens and um when i did that sweating on the dance floor thing it was this record was probably an, an influence on that because that was like okay i'm get the jungle brothers version i'm going to get the zap version i'm going to put them together and i'm not going to do anything else i'm just going to make sure that they're in key and on tempo and just make the transitions really nice and clean and get it mastered and blah 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 so yeah look as long as i got woo by sam um on wax nerds like that's um yeah one of those records that i just found Awesome. Amazing. And, I can and, uh, see uh, him uh, in Wales blushing right now. Uh, <laughs> it's true, <laughs> man. Him. Look, honestly, um, like, you know, true words have never been said. It's um, it's one of yeah, the yeah, records yeah. that... Yeah, no, it's uh, nice to hear, isn't it? You know, it's nice to hear stuff ga- like that. I, I feel it's, it's definitely a game changer. And I'm sure there was examples previous to that um, of that sort of style of production. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I've always been a sucker for the cut and paste production and just keeping it simple. So um, that was my first one. Um the second one, I just had to do it. This is the first seven inch I ever bought. And okay. as we said, my first 12 inch was run DMC. So this yeah. is, um, this is the Mary Mary. Yeah. I think this might just be the generic Oz pressing. Um, I'm yeah, sure it I, looks actually like I do have the picture pressing. I do have the picture edition somewhere downstairs. Um, for me, um, anything by run DMC, oh. um, just brings me back to getting into hip hop for the first time. Um, but I love how, um, I, I just, I miss a lot of the up-tempo rap. I really do. Um, like anything around that above 110, that's just sort of got that sort of dance floor tempo. Um, I just love it. And yeah, like I said, I'm a sucker for anything by Run DMC. So that, yep. um, that record for me is more of a nostalgic one. Um, and it's just one of the first songs that I ever knew all the words to, you know, it was just like, um, Mary, Mary. And, you know, watching the film clip back in the day, uh, was really cool. Um, now the other one, this is an electro. Th- I just thought I'd find something that's, I don't know if it's rare or, or obscure and I'm a bit funny with my record collecting. I'm not, I'll like write on my records and put stickers on them. I'm not one of those collectors yep. who has to keep everything mint. I'll write the BPMs all on it. I'll use it. Um, and I don't it's care. It's a tool, what label, isn't it? It's a tool. Uh, yeah, it's absolutely a tool. I don't care what label it's on. I don't really care where it was pressed. I care if it sounds good or not. And yep. that's pretty much the only thing. So I don't know if this is a rare record or, or not. Um, it's um, COD. It's an electro version of Gil Scott Heron's um, 
in the bottle. And right, um, okay. Yeah. It's just got the best eight oh eight beats on it and just the most amazing it's just one of those uh, it's a great example of turning um a classic song into an electro song. But um yep. yeah, I don't know if it's a rare record or not. I just know that I when I play it, I love it. Um <laughs> and it's um just a bit of a nod to my love of um eighties electro and that sort of stuff as well. Um Oh shit, eighty three. So yeah, it's pretty early on. Um, there you go. So there's a vocal and um, an instro on the other side. Um, and I just wanted to also hold that one up because yeah, I know I know you said three, but this is four. Um, no, and I know it's, it's one, of, and I know it's one of mine. But um, yeah. the whole thing of um, Black Buffalo getting behind me and just you know, I want to give them a massive shout out because you know, being like an artist from Australia, for them to just get on board and go we're going to help you out and put out some of your records um, yep. has been really cool. And the whole concept of once after I did Beastie Floyd, I was looking for something else to sink my teeth into. And I really wanted to get into some African sort of style stuff because I'd always been into it and I loved it. And yep. yeah, to be able to put that Q-tip and that, um, that breathe and stop with the, um, I love oh, that record. Yeah. What, it's brilliant. What's his name again? <laughs> the original guy. I can't remember. I'm, I've, yeah. I've, don't have the best memory for that sort of stuff. Um, Ebo Taylor, I think it was. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, for, for me, just when I was able to realize that I can take any genre and just put loops and breaks and raps on it and turn it into a new thing, it's just sort of been like this, another moment in my sort of um, my journey where I've been like, okay, there's really nothing that I can't do now <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> in terms of like splicing music together right uh, so yeah for me to be able to make an afro track into a hip-hop track and make it equal parts of both and the feedback that i've had on that is incredible um coco played it and um that yeah. was like amazing i saw him doing two copies of it when i when it first dropped and i was just like man this is so unreal like um yeah sometimes you don't realize what you're doing until after you've done it and then you go well wow that's cool that you know people really appreciated that and i'm always trying to make stuff that's i don't want to do anything I, I try not to even have my radar on to what other djs and edit producers are doing i yeah. really i really try to just be influenced by my own record collection and my own inspirations and make yeah. art art that mean is meaningful to me i feel like it'd be so easy to just you know get a i mean and sometimes you do you dumb it down a little bit but um it, i mean it's so easy to just go i'm gonna get cool in the gang and then put biggie over the top of it or whatever it might be like just yeah. generic sort of stuff like that it's like it doesn't really you know test it doesn't really push the boundaries anymore does it it becomes no. it, it becomes <laughs> too safe um so yeah i'm always looking at just trying to do things that are a little bit um a little bit left of center um so yeah the african hip-hop um theme you know that was fun um and then i did the safari scars album after that which was another whole album of afro um hip-hop remixes too <coughs> excuse me which has been going really well too so yeah um I don't really awesome. know what's next at the moment. Like I said, I'm working on this Trouble Funk Mega Mix at the moment that I'm really happy with. Um, but I yeah. can't say when or if that will be finished or whether it's going to be a two-sided seven-inch or I'm probably at about the four or five-minute mark at the moment. But, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Cool. Well, that yeah. sounds definitely uh, something to look forward to. Great choices. Um, really great tracks. Um, right. The other thing we do here on part of my journey, and it has been controversial in the past uh, with an Australian who was on the show um, in terms of the uh, confectionery, but confectionery corner. So... I think you said you you've organised and you have got some uh, local confectionery to show us. Something. Let's see I what you got. I, I don't know if confectionery is the word, and I don't know how big these are in the UK, but this is like the quintessential, quintessential Australian biscuit. The Tim Tams are they? I've, see, I've heard of them, but I don't know what they are. I'm oh trying to look. God. They look like they could be like a penguin. Oh my so God. hold on, is okay. it is it biscuit, chocolate cream okay. in the middle, biscuit, and then covered I'm that? It, it looks like a penguin. These things are the best biscuits I've ever tasted in the world. So <laughs> it's like a chocolate biscuit yeah. on the inside. Um, two layers two layers of yeah. biscuits. Um, chocolate in the middle and then wrapped around chocolate on the outside. Hang on. Yeah. Do they come in different flavours? 
They do come in different flavors now. That yeah, layer yeah. in the middle is like yep. chocolate cream. Then you got a chocolate biscuit on top, chocolate biscuit on the bottom, and then the whole thing's wrapped in chocolate. Yeah. Without a doubt, the most famous Australian biscuit. Um, it, it is a penguin, yeah. <laughs> it's literally it's it's as quintessential as Vegemite over here. It's like um, Tim Tams. If you buy them in our house, they last about an hour. Like, you know, once the kids find out, they're gone. Um, but now they've brought out, <laughs> they've brought out like double chocolate ones and they've right. changed the, the flavor of the creams on the inside. But everyone still knows that, yeah, the original Tin Tams, those ones are still the best. And look, it might not be confectionery, but. No, no, no. It's chocolate a, it's is, a, it's is, a pretty is perfect. Close, it's a pretty close line. Um, yeah. The original original sam saying tim tams are not mentioned by men at work though so <laughs> vegemite wins <laughs> oh, that's classic maybe Classics. someone maybe some aussie rock act should chuck in a shout out to yeah. tim tams um but i can't believe they're not a thing in the uk because i mean i mean i can believe it like but... i said that i think they're, they're just mm. penguins yeah they're just the same thing um damon are the mcdonald penguins, uh, are the penguins actually shaped like penguins, but similar? No, no, to... no. They, they look exactly like what you just showed okay. me. Okay, they're right, the same right. thing. I'll, I'll get a penguin and I'll, I'll send you a photograph at some point. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Damon McDonald's is saying, um, "Can we get a free Tim Tam with every forty-five we order?" <laughs> if you like melted chocolate on your vinyl, yeah. then I'm happy to throw one in. But um, I look, you know, I like troubleshooting. Maybe, a, maybe there's a way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or seal bars at Audi. There is lots of. Uh, uh, chocolates available at all these <laughs> supermarkets <clears throat> um cool well it's been brilliant um tell us briefly what the next st stage is as I you said about trouble mm. funk um mm. is there anything else you're working on at the moment or do you think that's the thing and, I, and i'll find someone to raid to yeah look i'm just um i don't quite know i'm off i'm always thinking about what i'm going to do next but a lot of the time it doesn't happen when you're thinking about it it's when you're like driving home on the way after work and you finally got a bit of a clear head and something just pops into your head so yeah the trouble funk thing was something like i feel like excuse me for the last couple of years i've wanted to get back into doing mega mixes because that's where it all started and that's like something i really love doing um but yeah look um i don't know yet but that's what i'm doing at the moment but yeah who knows um yeah could be anything could be anything but chris i just wanted to say mate thank you so much for having me on board and um oh thank sorry you for, been... sorry for just me talking the whole time i felt like no um, no no that's, wanted... that's the whole point <laughs> i talk enough of my own streams you know it's nice to have these conversations <laughs> but thank you so much we're going to go and see uh disco snack who's doing so today is the precursor to tomorrow's 10 inch 10th of october tomorrow's 10 inch day Actually, it's 10 inch oh, day, right. obviously, in, uh, in in probably Australia. Uh, so we're going to go see uh, Disco Snack, who's doing the pre warm up party. But thank you so much. It's been brilliant. Um, no, if anyone's awesome. uh, wanting to hear it or miss some of it, it's all going to be on YouTube. It's all going to be on Mixcloud. Uh, if you are watching back on one of those, then obviously hit that subscribe button or hit that follow button. Um, but, Scott, if you hang on there for a minute, I'm just going to raid out and say Absolutely. thank you to everyone else and uh, catch you all very, very soon. Peace out, people. Take it easy.